Hello Abnormal Family, this is the two a day drop month, or at least we're going to try to for most of the days. Um, I hope you enjoy this one. We're going to throw in some different things, which Dogman and Sasquatch are always our main focus, but we are Abnormal Investigations, so we look at a lot of different things. So 5 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time will probably be a little bit of different drops, but really good drops, I think. And then 8 o'clock will be the cryptid. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Anyone who has ever been to the Rockies, and especially anyone who's ever lived there, will tell you that the mountains are colder than they look in all of those old cowboy movies. It's a grasping cold that makes your whole body ache, unlike the dull, numbing cold of Michigan or Pennsylvania in the wintertime. And that cloying, gripping cold is precisely what I found myself experiencing on a dark October morning in Idaho not quite two years ago. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me give you a little bit of context first. I have been a pretty avid hunter and outdoorsman for most of my life. And ever since I turned 18, I've been applying for the tag lottery a few states out. West hoping the chance to, you know, hunt mountain lion and goat. Finally, after several years of applying, my number came up in Idaho. And I soon received my tag in the mail. Unfortunately, Due to a few scheduling conflicts, I couldn't go on my hunt until the last week of October toward the end of the legal season, and well past the mild weather days of August and September. Now, a hunt for mountain goats is one of the most physical, demanding, and skill-intensive endeavors a hunter can undertake in North America. A true adventure of a lifetime. Even in ideal conditions, you have to hike steep mountains, have a good set of binoculars, and sharp eyes. Know how to camp efficiently, and of course, you also need to be crack shot. Late in the season, such a hunt becomes even more strenuous due to the short hours of daylight and the more hostile weather. Not to mention the fact that a lot of local predators are in overdrive trying to bulk up before the lean winter months. However, I wasn't about to let that little bit of cold wind and snow come between me and one of my ultimate dream hunts, so I immediately began planning. I was worried I would have to make the cross country drive, but luckily for me, an old college friend of mine was working as an engineer for a big cobalt mine in eastern Idaho, and he was willing to let me ship most of my gear to him ahead of time. Besides, he had an elk tag that he wanted to fill that season, so we could camp together and help one another scout and hunt. In the final few weeks leading up to my trip, I started checking the local news from the area it would be hunting in just to keep an eye out of severe weather or other hazards. As a side effect, I got to see all the small town news from western Idaho as well. Most of it was pretty mundane, but one story that caught my eye was a mysterious disappearance of two hunters who were lost and were last seen on a swath of public land just southeast of where my buddy and I would be hunting. Of course, people go missing from the big state parks and public hunting lands all the time. And they're usually found alive in just a few days thanks to the hard work and trained professionals. Maybe they stayed too far from the trails and got lost, or maybe they just took a tumble in some rocky mountain gorge and were really, really hurt. Typically, nothing too out of the ordinary. But occasionally, there are accidents and animal attacks that people don't walk away from. So I always pay attention to stories like that in order to prevent something similar from happening to me. Anyway, on the day of the big trip, finally arrived, and after a long flight and even a longer drive, I found myself at a little hotel in a small town called Slate Creek, not too far from a huge tract of public land we would be hunting on. My friend arrived less than an hour later, and we quickly got settled in before heading down the street to grab some supper at a local diner. We had a good time and caught up over our dinner. But at one point, I happened to look up at the TV on the wall, and the headline scrolling across the bottom of the screen ominously read, Missing Hunters Found Slain Near Hell's Canyon. Mountain Lion Attack Suspected. This definitely caught my attention because a mountain lion won't usually attack more than one human, so there's usually safety in numbers. However, on the rare occasion that they do attack a group of more than one person, the attacks aren't usually fatal. A couple of fit hikers were a hunting party of grown adults usually more than capable of forcing even determined cougar to retreat. 
This is especially true for two hunters who would certainly have been armed with rifles and probably would have been toting pistols and skinning knives as well. Any mountain lion capable of mauling two heavily armed outdoorsmen to death simultaneously was certainly not one I would want to meet. An adult cougar can have a territorial range of up to 300 square miles, and this put the region of our hunt easily within its patrol range, considering we would be camped out on the hunting right on the edge of Hell's Canyon. However, my buddy and I have talked previously about the possibility of running into predators during our hunt, and we had packed accordingly with him carrying a 10 millimeter automatic and me lugging my 44 Magnum. Still, we decided to take some extra precautions. To that end, we got up early the next day, and after I had enjoyed what would likely be my last hot shower for a close to a week, we met up at a trading post in town which dealt in all sorts of camping and hunting gear. We picked up a few perimeter bells for our campsite, and we each bought a box of hard cast bullets designed for penetrating thick and muscular hides of predators. They may kick like a mule, but they certainly don't play around when it comes to stopping power. While in the trading post, we asked the owner of a quiet man of about 50 with the salt and pepper hair and skin weathered from decades of outdoorsmanship if he had ever seen anything like the cougar attack that had been in the news last night. I was hoping he would give us some advice on protecting our camp, but what we got instead was far more unsettling. I've seen the wilderness out here kill a lot of people in a lot of ways, but it's been a long time since I last saw anything as brutal as this. Usually, if you find more than one person at a time that's been killed, it was the work of something walking on two legs, not four, if you catch my drift. Every now and again, though, a couple of hikers will walk up on a sow, on a sow, grizzly with cubs, and will find them all mangled up in a week or so. But bears always leave their tracks behind, and it's not the right time of year for them to be raising cubs anyway. No, sir, we said to him. The last time anything like this happened was about two decades back when we had a whole rash of weird happenings. Everything from house cats and hens all the way up to prize-winning bulls was found gutted, mauled, chewed on, and otherwise turned into a fine red paste for nigh on a month. It's pure, and it sure put a damper on business around here. I'll tell you that much. The ranger said it was a cougar back then, too, but I didn't believe him then anymore than I do now. My buddy looked at one another easily before turning back to the store owner and asking if it was a cougar then the game wardens were right but if it wasn't a cougar then what was it? The man behind the counter simply grinned and continued his tale. Well after a couple of weeks of livestock getting mauled some local ranchers decided to take matters into their own hands. They went out hunting one night and bagged themselves three of the biggest mountain lions anybody around here had ever seen. And when the rangers examined the cougars, they found that all three of them were related. You see, if a mother puma has more than one kit, she'll teach them to hunt in all the same way and in the same time and in the same area. The rangers were thinking that the mother of those three had brought them up hunting livestock. So that was just all they knew. A couple of folks weren't so sure, though. One old-timer that lived up in the hills told stories of a behemoth cat that had been stalking the woods around his cabin. And it wasn't just some mountain lion either. He said it stood taller than even the largest mountain lion, and its pelt was black as sin. That men had fought it for two years and had fought it in two wars, but he said that creature scared them stiff. And not two nights later, the worst incident of the whole string happened right here in town. One of the rangers, some rookie that had just moved here from California, was walking back to the ranger station from the diner. Keep in mind, that's a walk of less than 300 yards. And the rest of the rangers in the station never saw him again. They didn't find anything left of the boy the next morning except for a slick of blood in his freshly shined shoes. Left at the scene of the attack while he had been plucked right out of him. Not long after that, though, a group of rangers was seen sweeping the town and heading off into the wilderness. And from what I've heard, they followed that thing's tracks all the way up to an old silver mine back in the hills. None of the rangers have ever talked much about exactly what they saw up there, but several hikers in the area reported hearing a hell of gunfire right at dusk. Sure enough, the killings and maulings never happened again after that night. But I'll tell you what, if there's another one of those things out there roaming the wild now, then you can bet your bottom dollar 
it won't be sticking around to see how everything turns out this time. This thing will be definitely on the hunt. It was a hell of a story to be sure, and it took me some time to take it in. But I couldn't... It couldn't all be true, right? No cat that big that ever attacked anybody that aggressive could possibly remain hidden on public game land, I told myself. The two of us thanked the man for the info, paid for our ammo, paid for our supplies, and after that, we got on our way as quickly as we could. Our time was limited, and listening to the man's story had put us behind schedule. Our last stop on the way out of town was at the ranger station to check in and inform the rangers of where we would be and what we would be doing. There was only an officer on duty since it was so late in the season, so I figured we would probably be able to get through check-in pretty quickly. But as we answered his questions about our firearms and tags, I thought back to the outfitter's story. I asked the old ranger if there had been anybody mutilated by animals found recently or if there was any dangerous wildlife in the area we should be aware of. After all, we would be camping back in the wilderness for a close to a full week. The ranger froze for a few moments and he quietly zipped my .30-06 rifle back into its case before raising his eyes to meet mine. I suppose you heard about those two bodies over at Hills Canyon. To tell you the truth, there's a lot of nooks and crannies in these hills where something could be hiding, but we've got our best men out there working to keep this place safe. Still, you two should be extra careful out there, and if I were you, I wouldn't split up. I'm really not supposed to do this, but if you've got a notepad handy, I'll give you boys our radio frequency, and just in case you need us, you'll be able to get a hold of us. This was way out of the ordinary, since game wardens and rangers never give out their radio frequencies. If everyone in the area with a radio could listen to them, a poacher could have a heyday with all of that unsecured information. For the park service to be handing out secure channel information, they must have been truly desperate for as many eyes and ears as possible. To make things even more unsettling, the sign-in book, there were only four other hunters in the section of the wilderness, two individuals and one duo. Of course, there could be others out there that hadn't signed in, an extremely stupid idea in such a large and dangerous wilderness. But this late in the season, I certainly didn't expect the area to be crowded, even though being so isolated and alone was less than ideal if there was truly something dangerous roaming the area. I have to admit, I was relieved that I would have to worry, but I wouldn't have to worry about too many people hunting our spot. We finished our check-in at the ranger station by noon, and it was finally time to head back into the wilderness for what would hopefully be the hunt of a lifetime. In fact, it would definitely be once-in-a-lifetime experience, but not in the way we initially expected. We drove my buddy's pickup as far as we could along winding gravel roads well back into the public game lands, and when we finally found a good area to park on the side of the road, we packed all of our camping supplies into our two huge backpacks and started hiking even further into the wilderness. After all, if you really want to find where all the record book animals are, you have to go where most hunters won't. All in all, we probably hiked a little over a mile further uphill to get to the good base camp location. We finally got settled into a nice little clearing surrounded by a dense forest of about six o'clock. Just as the sun was setting over the beautiful Rocky Mountain landscape, we pitched our tents and we set up a few lines of string, small bells on them around the edges of the clearing. And we finally stopped for a simple but filling supper of canned soup cooked over a small campfire. I was so tired from hiking and so happy to be out in the wilderness on such an adventure that I completely forgot all about the strange rumors and unsettling happenings. And the next two days were free of any weird incidents. We scouted the ridge lines and timber thickets, searching for just the right place to set up our perfect shot, and the whole time we never saw anything out of the ordinary, even now and again, though we would. Most of the time, it was just a ranger checking in, giving his location across our radio, but more than once the voice on the other end was uneasy as one of the rangers called in findings a severely mutilated elk or mule deer. What was even more ominous was that if it was checked our maps and marked out our locations, their mutilated animals had been found, a pattern started to emerge, and it looked like whatever was leaving these mauled animals in its wake 
was headed our way. At the end of the third day, we had found the absolute perfect place to lie and wait for a big billy goat, and we were planning on getting there early the next morning. We were both bone tired from hiking all day, but as we sat around the warm fire waiting for our dinner of sausages and hash browns to finish cooking, we both became aware of an approaching sound in the woods beyond our clearing. We were both reluctant to leave the warmth of the fire, but finally, I made myself stand up and head toward the tree line with my 44 in one hand and the lantern in the other. There was barely a sliver of the waning moon in the sky, so my visibility was limited to how far the lantern could reach out in the cold black darkness. The sounds grew closer and closer and soon the crackle of leaves and branches was accompanied by heavy breathing. I brought my revolver up and I pulled the hammer back, bracing myself for some horrible demon cat to come bursting out from the shadows of the forest. Instead, I heard the sound of a human voice call out from about 50 feet into the tree line. Hello, is someone over there? Relieved, I called back. Yeah, there's a clearing not far in this direction. Just come toward my voice slowly. What the hell are you doing out here on this at on this late and without a light? A few moments later, a pair of men dressed in camouflage clothes and safety orange toboggans stumbled out of the woods and into the light of my lantern. The two men looked haggard and spooked, but after taking a moment to catch their breath, they introduced themselves. I recognized their names from the sign-in sheet at the ranger station. They explained that they had followed a wounded elk into the brush and gotten lost without their flashlights. Being lost in the woods at night is a scary enough concept on its own, but they told me next sent a real shiver down my spine. They explained that they had shot a fine bull elk from across the gully and before they could track him though the brush they had to hike down the side of a mountain and then up the slope of another. By the time they crossed the gulch they found the blood trail and began tracking the wounded bull. It had been over an hour. They spent a further 45 minutes or so following blood splatter or broken branches through the brush and when they finally come to the clearing they hadn't found exactly the site they had been expecting. Sure enough the carcass of the elk was sitting there in the middle of the clearing, but it had been torn apart. Limbs and bones had been tossed aside and the entrails had been torn out and devoured. Large hunks of the meat still hang onto the bones in places, so whatever had been at the elk had either had its fill with the innards or had simply been mutilating the carcass for the pleasure of it. Both hunters said they had gotten an extremely uneasy feeling, and they had been debating on whether or not to try and salvage a rack when they had realized darkness was beginning to fall. So we hightailed it out of there as quick as we could, but we must have gotten turned around somewhere in the underbrush because we certainly didn't end up back where we started. Thank goodness we finally found you too, or we might still have been wandering around out there in the morning. Your fire saved us. The two were clearly exhausted, so we offered to let them share our campsite for the night, and we threw a few extra sausages on the griddle. They thanked us and said they would be on their way at first light. And as we ate, I asked if they could think of any more details that might reveal the identity of whatever had mauled the wounded elk. They said there had been a few prints, but the fading light and the mud and the blood from the carcass they hadn't really been able to tell exactly how large the prints had been. Though they both agreed that the tracks looked like those of a mountain lion or a bobcat. Moreover, they both reported feeling like they were being watched during their walk through the woods in the dark. We never saw anything but occasionally we hear a rustling in the bush or we catch a quick movement of the corner of our eye or all the hairs on the back of our necks would stand up all of a sudden but we figured it might have just been our heads playing tricks on us in the dark we talked for a few more minutes as we made our plans for the morning but soon our exhaustion got the better of us and we all decided to hit the hay for the night we doused our fire and soon we retired to our tents my buddy would be staying with me in my tent for the night and the other hunters would be sharing his tent. I didn't take very much supplies so we was worried about food and water but they said they would be on their way in the morning. It didn't take long for us to fall asleep. Since a light snow had begun to fall on our warm quilts and sleeping bags had never seemed more cozy and inviting. At some point during the night however I woke from my peaceful slumber. I'm a pretty light sleeper so at first I figured my friend had just shifted any sleep or something like that, but soon I heard it, the soft tinkling of the bells. Something had bumped the line of the small bell strung 
around the perimeter of our campsite. Now at first I assumed it was probably one of the two guests. Maybe one of them had gotten up to use the bathroom out in the trees and maybe they had bumped a trip line. But then I heard it again, louder this time. It was like someone was playing with a string and bells, swatting and jerking the line to elicit the quiet jingle of the little tin bells. Again and again the string thrummed from the impact of the bells, tinkled as they were tossed around on the line. By this point, I was starting to get a little nervous, and I reached down to the floor of the tent next to my sleeping bag and I found my 44 in its holster. I'm not sure if I made a noise as I moved or whatever it was, just got bored with the line of bells, but as soon as I set up the jingling stopped, and the night again fell silent with no noise whatsoever except for the soft crinkle of a falling snow. The next morning, we rose early, coming out of our warm cocoons at 3.50. We brewed a quick cup of coffee in the morning darkness and munched on some trail mix as we got our backpacks ready. However, when we were about to set out for the ridge line, we found the day before our flashlights caught something. So we caught something menacing pressed into the fresh snow. Coming to do, into the campsite from the same place where the two hunters had stumbled out of the woods the night before was a trail of paw prints, and I'm talking big ones. They followed the exact path that the two other hunters had taken from the edge of the woods to the fire pit. And then they made a large circle around the tent where the two men were sleeping in. But the weird thing is, these were bipedal. Before crossing the campsite again and ending before the line of bells on the far side of the site, only to continue again about 15 feet further into the forest. It was almost like whatever had stopped around the campsite had jumped a short distance to avoid the bells at the end of the clearing. I realized that the sound I'd heard the night before must have been the thing playing with the bells on the way to the campsite, amusing itself with our security measures. Measures it was smart enough to avoid triggering on the way out. Now I was severely creeped out and I decided at this point, combined with the story of the mutilated elk from the day before, qualified as unusual, enough to report to the ranger service. I called it in over the radio, giving the sleepy ranger on duty our location and the story that the other men had given us. They told us to stay put. Of course, if we wanted to be in position on time, we couldn't afford to wait a few hours. We opted instead to just leave a note taped to the inside flap of the other hunter's tent before going on our way. It was bone-chillingly cold morning, and to be hiking up land down steep mountain ridges with a heavy pack and a rifle. But I knew there was no other way I'd be bagging a nice goat, so we continued on our way with determination. Whenever we finally reached the base of the rim, we were laying there, waiting to take our shot at this creature. We could hear it walking and following the whole time we had been going to our place. But we never seen it. It was more than enough to set me on edge, and I quietly cycled my rifle's bolt, putting it around into the chamber just in case pretty soon we noticed the sky was getting brighter. So we decided to go ahead and hike up to the top of the ridge. We made it about halfway up to the steep hills before my buddy pointed out just how eerily calm the morning was. We hadn't noticed it on the way there, but everything was so calm, everything was so quiet, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We never ended up seeing anything, but we did see the bipedal tracks again, and there was blood, like it had went back and got the rest of the kill that had dripped and saturated the snow that went off down into the valley to where they were never found. Yep, you heard me. Never found. When we met the wardens back at our campsite, that's when it all came together. Our tent that we had left the strangers sleeping in was ripped up. They were missing, and a blood trail. To my knowledge, they have never been found. We left, never getting our, our game, but I'll guarantee you we're never going back. There's something up there hunting people. And I believe the wardens know what it is. I uh, makes me wonder if they didn't shoot something more than the elk, or if they shot something they shouldn't have shot, and uh, it hunted them down for revenge. That would be one of my thoughts. Uh, what do you guys think? Um, thank you for sharing this encounter. Um, that is my thought, though. I think that they probably done something they shouldn't have done, 
and that's why it was tracking them and it finally got its revenge that would be my guess but uh what do you guys think thank you for listening guys until next time keep your head on a swivel don't be something's dinner and we'll see you on the next one